Today we're going to be performing a full service in this Kubota RTV X1140. We'll begin in the back by servicing the engine and transmission, then we'll move up front and change the coolant and the fluid in the front gearboxes. Finally, we'll finish by hitting all the grease points. Part of the reason that I've decided to film this work is that the operator's manual does an extremely poor job in explaining certain aspects of the servicing of this machine, particularly as it pertains to the hydrostatic transmission and the transmission case. I'll go over those points in detail in a moment, and hopefully once I do, you'll be able to service your machine without any issues. Let's first talk about where everything is located on this machine. First, the engine is underneath the rear seat, and the transmission is bolted to the back of it underneath the bed. To access the engine, simply fold the rear seat forward and remove the plastic access panel underneath. I'll put up a picture of that now. Here's what the top of the engine looks like. The fill cap is right here on top, and the dipstick is on the passenger side towards the back. The engine oil filter is right here underneath the alternator. You'll see the process of changing that in a moment. You can access the transmission case, as I have here, by lifting the bed all the way up. The transmission case extends roughly to where I'm outlining with my mouse cursor. The transmission case houses the range gearing, differential, final drive, and front drive gearing. On top, you can see the cap on the fill port. The dipstick is integrated into the cap. Here's a picture of the back of the machine after removing the rear guard. This component at the very back is the hydrostatic transmission. The hydrostatic transmission is responsible for sending power from the engine to the wheels. We'll talk more about this in a moment, but for now just remember that the hydrostatic transmission is bolted to the back of the transmission case. This is the hydraulic tank, located underneath the front passenger seat. The hydraulic tank's fill cap with integrated dipstick is accessed from the top by folding the front seat forward. The hydraulic tank holds the fluid that is used for the power steering, the lift cylinder on the bed, any extra hydraulic implements attached to the machine, and, very importantly, the hydrostatic transmission. This is the point that Kubota does not make clear in their documentation. Even though the hydrostatic transmission is bolted onto the transmission case, they share no fluid. Instead, quite counterintuitively, the hydrostatic transmission gets its fluid from the hydraulic tank that you see right here, located on the opposite end of the machine. To clarify how this works, let's now go back to the picture of the hydrostatic transmission and talk about it in a bit more detail. You can see here that the hydrostatic transmission has two filters attached to it. Kubota calls the filter towards the front of the vehicle the transmission oil suction filter, and the one towards the back they call the transmission oil VHT filter. VHT stands for variable hydrostatic transmission. But once again, Kubota makes no mention of the fact that the fluid passing through these filters comes from the hydraulic tank not the transmission case only a few inches away. To clarify any confusion, let's now talk about how the fluid flows from the tank to the hydrostatic transmission. Right here underneath the VHT filter is a small pump called the charge pump. The charge pump pulls fluid from the hydraulic tank through the suction filter. After being filtered, the fluid then enters the charge pump and is then pushed through the VHT filter. After passing through this second filter, the fluid finally enters the hydrostatic transmission. Note that the separate fluid contained within the transmission case is not filtered. This fluid is effectively just gear oil. Its only purpose is to lubricate the differential, range, and other gearing within the transmission case. It has nothing to do with any of the hydraulic implements on the machine, including the hydrostatic transmission. Let's now briefly discuss how the hydrostatic transmission works. A full explanation would require its own separate video, so here I just want to cover the basics. This is a view of the inside of the hydrostatic transmission on this machine. You can see here that there are two shafts that interface with the transmission case, a pump shaft on the bottom and a motor shaft on the top. The pump shaft is driven by the input shaft on the transmission, which itself is driven directly by the engine. So for all intents and purposes, you can think of the pump shaft as being driven by the engine. The pump shaft drives a variable displacement piston pump. This pump takes hydraulic fluid within the hydrostatic transmission case and pressurizes it to over 3,000 PSI. This high pressure fluid is then sent up to a variable displacement piston motor, which uses it to drive the motor shaft. The motor shaft provides power to the gearing in the transmission case, which ultimately drives the wheels of the vehicle. So in summary, the piston pump takes mechanical energy from the engine and converts it into fluid energy. The high pressure fluid is then directed to the piston motor where the energy is converted back into mechanical energy to drive the wheels. In this particular hydrostatic transmission, the displacement of both the pump and the motor can be varied. In the case of the pump, this means that it can dynamically adjust the amount of fluid that it's pressurizing. 
Similarly, the motor can adjust the amount of pressurized fluid that it takes in to drive the wheels. It's this ability of the hydrostatic transmission to vary its displacement, which allows for stepless speed changes. This is why the hydrostatic transmission doesn't need a clutch. To make things a bit more clear, here is a view of the engine and transmission assembly. Let's quickly go over how this whole system works together. Component number two in this diagram is the engine. Component three is the transmission case with the hydrostatic transmission bolted to the back of it. Power from the engine crankshaft is sent to the input shaft in the transmission, which passes through the transmission case to the pump shaft on the hydrostatic transmission. The piston pump then sends high pressure fluid to the piston motor, which uses it to drive the motor shaft. Power from the motor shaft is directed back into the top of the transmission case, where after passing through some gearing, it drives the wheels. Continuing with our overview of the machine, here's a view underneath the hood. Up front is the hydraulic oil cooler. This is for the fluid in the hydraulic tank, not the transmission case. Right behind it are the radiator and overflow tank. On the passenger side is the airbox with two filters. And finally on the driver's side is the brake fluid reservoir. Brake fluid is something that doesn't need to be changed very often, so it's the only item I won't be servicing. Lastly, here's the fuel filter. It's located on the passenger side of the machine, about two thirds of the way back. It's possible to fully service this machine without lifting it, but it's much less trouble if you do. I'm gonna use these ramps that I built. I'll put a link in the description to the video showing how I made them. To access the oil pan, we have to remove this skid plate. It's held in place by five 12 millimeter bolts. It's best to change the engine oil when it's hot, so I'm going to let the machine idle for 10 minutes. Now it's time to service the transmission case. 
Remember, the oil in the transmission case is basically just gear oil. It's in there to lubricate the differential, the range gearing, the gearing for the four-wheel drive. There's really nothing special about it, and there's no filters associated with it. There's just a fill port with an integrated dipstick on top, and two plugs on the bottom. The first plug is a normal drain plug, and the second plug is a magnet plug. Let's pull those plugs now. I'm letting the fluid drip out of the transmission case for a few minutes, and while we're waiting, we can take a look at this magnet plug here. There's quite a few metal shavings on it. I'll put a close-up image of it on screen. All you have to do to clean it up is just take a clean shop towel and wipe it down. That looks a lot better. Now that we're ready to refill the transmission case, I'm going to fold this back seat forward. It makes access much easier. The last thing to do while the back of the vehicle is elevated is to replace the fuel filter. It's easier to do this if we first remove the protective metal bracket. There are three hoses that attach to the fuel filter housing. Kubota's labeled one of the hoses yellow, the next one purple, and then there's one without a label. The yellow hose is just an air return line. It attaches to the top of the fuel tank and allows any trapped air to return to tank. The purple hose carries fuel to the fuel lift pump. The unlabeled hose attaches to the bottom of the fuel tank. I'm going to clamp off this hose to ensure that when I remove the fuel filter, I don't end up losing all of the fuel in the tank. Here's what the filter bowl and filter element look like after being removed from the tractor. This is the new filter element. It just slips right into the bowl after removing the old one. But before we do that, we need to take note of the fact that there are two gaskets on here. There's an outer gasket and an inner gasket. The new filter element doesn't come with either of these gaskets, so we're going to have to reuse them. The outer one is easy to remove. It just slips right off. The inner one is a bit more difficult, though. You have to be careful not to damage it. The best way to remove the old filter element is to take a pick like this, stick it in the middle, and slowly pry it out. <laughs> 
There we go. The filter bowl is quite dirty, so I'm going to wipe it down as best I can. Then I'm going to soak it in some kerosene for 10 minutes, wipe it down one more time, and then put everything back together. That's much better. Now that the fuel filter is back in place, the last thing to do is to bleed the fuel lines of air. The fuel lift pump on this machine has a lever on it. You have to keep pushing on that lever until you feel resistance. Once you feel resistance, you know that you're pumping fuel, not air. We're now ready to service the cooling system, but before doing that, I want to briefly talk about how the breather works. The breather, which you can see right here, is just a cap that screws off to open up the cooling system. It connects to the rest of the cooling system through this hose right here. 
Before servicing the cooling system, the breather needs to be opened and elevated. You'll see exactly how to do this next. When the coolant is draining, the breather allows air to easily enter the system. Conversely, when the coolant is being added back into the radiator, the breather allows air to escape. In this way, the breather helps to prevent the formation of any trapped air pockets.
I've saved this grease point for last. This is the grease point for the bearing on the front drive shaft. It needs to be greased about every 200 hours, so it should be done every time you change the engine oil. It's easy to miss because it's tucked away underneath the vehicle, but it's important not to forget about it, because if you do, you're going to end up with an expensive repair to your drive shaft. That just about does it for the maintenance on this Kubota. The only thing left to do is to put the skid plates back and do a final check of all the fluid levels. I'm going to do that off camera. As always, I hope that you enjoyed this content, and I hope that you learned something. And if you did, please like and subscribe.